finally, I'm going to show you uh, some of what's coming this summer with our 733 version. So kind of a peek under the hood. All right. So where we started, the motivation uh, for the water column tool um, was that data fusion uh, with all the current modalities that are out there, uh, bathymetry, backscatter, maps, et cetera, they're all pretty mature. Um, but what we really needed, what folks really were starting to need was information on the water column. What is happening in the water column? All the top side acquisition for water column data was Hey Mo, I think we lost audio there. Mo, we lost audio. Information. Hey Mo, Mo. So what Mo? we did is uh, we worked with the guys at Seacom. Mo, yeah. sorry, yes. you have to do that whole slide again. The audio went out, so if you want to um, repeat that. Can you hear me? We can hear you now, but we missed that whole slide. So just oh. um, go ahead back. <laughs> That one? Yeah. So just start at the beginning. Sorry. Oh, sorry. You can hear me now, right? Yeah, we hear you now. Okay. Um, the state of the, the top side for recording, for acquiring uh, water column data um, was mature, um, but most of the visualization uh, for, for the top side uh, systems were, you know, 2D swath plots or a long track plots. But we wanted to have a bigger picture. Um, and how we integrate water column uh, into the virtual environment. So what we did is we started working uh, with the guys at SeaCom at the University of New Hampshire, and they were using GeoZooey uh, to do integrated visualization, and they had come up with a couple of different metaphors um, that they used in a 3D environment. They had a, a midwater fan, uh, as you can see uh, here underneath the vessel. Um, they had exported 3D points and they're integrating that into a scene uh, with bathymetry and backscatter. So it seemed like a really good um, starting point uh, is to basically take what they had done in research and, and try to commercialize that into a product everyone could use. Now we had initial set of requirements uh, after we went through uh, you know, what was out there, what was available from the different types of sonars and what people would want. And one thing that stood out right away this was that we would probably need to unify a water column format. Every sonar manufacturer had their own file format, uh, and um, what we wanted to do was create a public format, and this is the generic water column format. And the analogy is that the GWC is to water column data, what the GSF is to um, bathymetric data. And the reason why we didn't extend uh, the GSF is the GSF uh, Notionally, it was one target per beam, or water column can be multiple targets per beam, um, and we wanted to come up with a different format that uh, fit the needs of not only the processing, but the virtual environment. Another thing we wanted to do is we wanted to have really easy um, mid-water feature extraction, uh, so provide ways to, to get to the, to the salient data from your, from, your, uh, from your sonar and be able to extract it really quickly. We wanted to be able to view the data and manage the data in nonlinear time. Uh, for example, you don't want to, you know, have it so that someone has to hit a play button and uh, wait for a file to play through uh, to get to a certain point to the to where they see their targets. We want to let them access data nonlinearly. We wanted to have different ways to view the data in the 4D environment, so we wanted to come up with different uh, metaphors uh, to export into Fleeter Mouse. And we also had some considerations for the potential for real-time use, so having it integrated into an acquisition environment. So that's where we started for our requirements. Some more requirements were um, that the data, data conversion, we wanted to support all of the formats uh, that were available um, uh, for systems that acquired water column, things like you know, the Resan uh, 7K systems, um, the Kongsberg series, so their .all formats, and the the .wcd format, um, the Odom uh, A3B, uh, the fishery sonars uh, from Sinrad Kongsberg, the ME70, EK60, EK500, um, XTF, so single beam sub-bottom, because um, a lot of the folks we were dealing uh, with early on were using XTF or SegY to do uh, uh, bubble tracking. They were using chirp systems to, to uh, look in the water column 
uh, to try to track down hydrate seeps and basically ignoring the seismic section. And then finally, now that we're part of QPS, uh, supporting the Quincy DB file format, uh, which records Kongsberg and the uh, R2Sonics water column data. In the GWC, we had this notion of an integrated ping. Um, many of the systems that do online acquisition will break up a water column ping, mainly due to its size, uh, into different frames, typically broken on beam boundaries. And what the GWC does is to integrate those back in together so a single ping packet has all the beams, the time series information, all the integrated navigation information. We also want it to allow for subsampling or compression. Um, some of the systems out there are highly oversampled, uh, and you end up with giant data files. So we wanted to give the user the ability to subsample that data. And then also allow for the integration of external navigation. So POSMB, POSPAC, uh, or ASCII import to get different nav sources in if your navigation is not part of your, your standard uh, acquisition system. Now, as far as the process flow, uh, we wanted to make it really easy. So we got it down to four steps. Uh, step one, import sonar data. Step two, do your conversion to GWC. Step three, use different types of thresholding techniques to identify the features of interest in the water column. And step four, export those to Fleet or Mouse into the Fuse environment. Now for importing data, uh, the first pass that we take is we do an index. We build an index on the source data file, so all data files that we support are indexed so we can access them non-linearly um, to speed up processing. All of the processing within the Midwater tools is multi-core aware, so you know, if you're ever wondering, geez, what kind of machine should I buy, uh, the more cores the better because we'll take advantage of them. And when you're processing um, data, especially um, water column data, um, those cores uh, really pay off in time reduction. Uh, for conversion, when you convert to GWC, it's a wizard base, so you pick your, uh, you pick the files that you want to do the conversion on, and you have some options uh, for export. And there's also a feature to do concatenation. This is a virtual concatenation, so certain systems, like some of the fishery sonars or single beam sonars, some folks might set up their top side to break lines every. 50 megabytes, so you might have 10 lines that make up one continuous uh, track line before you make a turn. So you might want to, you know, it's instead of ending up with 10 different GWCs, you can virtually concatenate those. What the Midwater tool does is it builds a virtual uh, index and then it concatenates them into a single, uh, the data into a single GWC file while always leaving the source data um, intact. So step three is filtering. Um, so now we're going to try to focus in on what's interesting um, in the water column uh, to export it. The first one is filtering by beam. So what you can do is you can limit uh, the part of the swath that you're looking at. Um, that's this control uh, right here. So this is a composite slider we call this. So you can bring it in from either side or slide it from side to side and move your, your beam range across the swath. So, you know, if you have some bad beams in the outer beams and you want to eliminate them, you can just zoom it in. And there's also a, a beam configurator that you can specifically uh, remove uh, particular beams from the swath. Next part of the filter is the range filter. Um, so very similar to beam filtering, you get another composite control. So you can uh, change the near range uh, and the far range. So you can basically box in what you're looking at. This is so you can get um, you know, you can eliminate near transducer noise if you get a lot of bubbles, um, or maybe pull the range in on the inside of the side load, so you can eliminate that. And then finally, the histogram, which is here. And very simple way, same kind of control, composite control, where you change your histogram range uh, to basically eliminate uh, low power signal, and then eliminate all the background noise. And then what you end up with is the the data element that you are, or the targets that you want to export to the virtual environment. Now the, the histogram, depending upon uh, the file type, um, can display either the raw amplitude uh, that's in the datagram, um, it can display power, and certain types of sonars, um, namely the fishery sonars, you can also get volume scattering and target strength. 
So you can display either one of those. Now for the metaphors, uh, there's four primary ones. There's new ones coming, but these are the four that we started with. Um, 40 beam line, 40 beam fan, uh, the point cloud, and the ISO volume. And you'll see each one of those. So the beam line object, uh, think of uh, Fleeter Mouse's seismic curtain, uh, very similar, it's an image, but it's aligned to the beam. So if you want to export beam 95, um, you know, you'll get, you know, you'll see it, a curtain that's basically slightly tilted because um, it's aligned to the beam angle. Um, what's nice about this metaphor is you get low distortion because um, you're not doing a cross track image, you're doing a long track. So depending upon the target that you're uh, you want to visualize, um, this can be a good metaphor for you. The cross-track fan, you know, the swath, so that gives you your, your cross-track view. You do have distortion, high distortion at range, you know, because your beam widens uh, as, as it moves away from the transducer. Um, but integrated in with the beam curtain uh, can help you uh, visualize certain types of targets. Point clouds, obviously, these are uh, boresite targets uh, with attribution. So these are the targets at the boresite of the sample uh, from each of the beams. Um, along with the attribution, you can also uh, get, you know, you'll get time, ping, beam, amplitude, and you can use those to do your color mapping. And now the, the points, you can also do um, uh, refraction. So you can, instead of exporting the boresighted solution, you can export a fully refracted solution if you're working with Kongsberg data. And finally, an ISO volume object. Um, so ISO surfaces, this is out of the medical industry. You basically have a, a, a brick of voxels of data where the data gets ray traced into those cells. The cells are, you define them to be a certain resolution, like a meter. And then the ISO surface is generated around a signal level of a certain size. And you can change that within Fleer Mouse um, to, to show you the different, uh, where the different uh, energy levels are uh, in the object. And what's interesting is uh, you can use that technique uh, if you load the object multiple times in Fleeter Mouse in a scene, as we did with this, um, then all you do is change your ISO level uh, for each of the objects, set some transparency, and what it does is it allows you to see some internal structure of interesting um, uh, targets like this plume. And finally, ASCII. Uh, we have a lot of folks that write their own MATLAB code, uh, especially in the fisheries uh, realm where they want to do sp have their own custom processing. Uh, so we have a way to export um, uh, ASCII information. And there's a couple of different choices uh, you can select um, for uh, the types of data you want to export. Now the applications, uh, we have hard targets, uh, our hydrographic users. Uh, so these are folks uh, doing, say, rec surveys, and they want to get better lease depths. Uh, water column systems are really good at finding um, or detecting masts, uh, protrusions from the wreck, um, snags like cables and nets and things that have, that have fallen on the wreck. And when you export um, the refractive solution, um, that data is really great to integrate into your PFM, then take into Flater Mouse and get your get your least up solution. Soft targets, we have our fisheries folks, so folks that want to see schools of fish, um, uh, or actually we get folks to see individual fish in, in the curtains from the EK60s. Um, oceanographic processes like plumes, hydrate seeps, or subsea volcanoes, uh, what I like to call our bubble people. So this is now we're saying we're really looking at water column data. This is a, 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 just a rough survey, demo survey that was done around an in-place rig in the Gulf of Mexico oil platform. Um, I didn't do any processing, additional processing or editing of this data, so it looks a little rough because I did it. I just threw it together. But this is to show you, you know, this is what you typically get from a bathymetric survey. But then when you add water column data, now I have, you know, additional components from the rig. And I can add more. I have a school of fish volume over here. And again, you can see more fish uh, in the water column as they're going down this track line. And this little closer view. So you can see the water column uh, gives you basically the rest of your picture. Uh, and when integrated with bathymetry and backscatter, uh, 
it gives you the big picture. Is there another example? This is uh, the Richmond Montgomery survey that was done by NetSurvey. Um, this is the uh, stacked view that you'll see uh, from the Midwater tool. So uh, left to right is a long track, and what you're doing is you're looking through the water column. All the beams have been collapsed and stacked, and we're getting max signal level. So it's easy to see um, the return from the wreck. This is the water column data from the wreck. That we do is we zoom in on that and then draw a little lasso around it and then export that as points to Flitter Mouse and bring it into a scene and that's what you get. As another example, a single beam. Uh, even with a single beam, this shows that you can get really good uh, three-dimensional quality. This was the survey done by Jens Reinhardt. So you have two things in this scene. You have um, a hydrate seep um, and you have fish. And because of the pattern uh, that they drove around the hydrate seep with the single beam, you get a good three-dimensional feel uh, for the composition of this seep. And this was a survey, a 7125 survey that was done by uh, Tom Weber at Seacom. Uh, where they had the 7125 pointed to the side of the vessel and they had an overhead spotter plane. So here's an aerial photograph of the spotter plane, here's the vessel, here's the school of tuna that they were tracking. And there's the point cloud exported from the midwater tool. And this is the, the uh, fan object actually. And just here's another view from the side. So you have all the pieces integrated. You have the, the um, the imagery from the aerial photograph, you have the exported points and the swath to show you where they were looking. And then finally, a uh, uh, deep sea volcano um, that was uh, done by NAVO with an EM-22 in, in uh, fairly deep water. Okay, so now it's probably a good pause point, Aaron, if anybody has any questions before I move to the demo. Hey Mo, thanks. Um, just one question quick. Um, do you know of any other uh, sonars coming online that are collecting water column other than the ones you listed that um, we might be supporting um, at the moment? Probably the latest one that we're supporting is the, the latest one I know of is the Arctusonics. Um, there may be some, Lindsay might be able to answer, there may be some uh, Perhaps not a Teledyne. He, yeah, Lindsay just Skyped me. Um, I guess he's afraid to talk today. He said uh, the Teledyne MB1 will be coming on. Yeah, soon. that's probably the next one. All right. And um, there was a question just about how that photo was integrated with the water column data. Um, I can, you can answer that, or I can. You can just. You can. Okay. Yes, uh, yeah, you can listen. If you're in Flader Mouse, um, Mo's going to show you how to get water column data in the Flader Mouse. And then it, to bring in an air photo, if it's georeferenced, you would just import the horizontal photo. Um, if it's not georeferenced, um, you would just kind of wiggle it in place. <laughs> that's the best way to explain it. All right, I think that's it for now, so you can continue on. Okay. All right, so what I'll do is I'll take you through a typical work session, nothing too complicated. All right. In the new version, we have a notion of projects. Uh, projects just make our lives uh, a lot easier because we keep the data organized. Um, we didn't used to have uh, uh, projects, but it allows you to basically go back in and, and continue with working. You know, put things aside for a bit. Tutor, I can't spell tonight. Here we go. Tutorial two. And also a big thing about projects is when you create a project and you load some source files in, you can then take that project into our other processing modules. Uh, like you could then, you know, if I do the water column processing, I can then move into our geocoder tool um, to do um, backscatter processing and then go into DMagic uh, to build a PFM and do the bathymetric uh, processing and editing. So what I'll do is I'll just add a sonar file. I'll use that same file so it's familiar to you. Okay, if you remember from the from the presentation, this is step one. So I load my file. Um, you get an overhead view in the map. This is the same map that you see in DMagic or FMGT. 
uh, in your tree view, uh, you get all the, the, the uh, metadata about the file that you loaded. So if you're ever curious, you know, what type of sensor this is, what modes are available, um, what datagrams uh, the file contains, this is actually a really good debugging tool. So if you ever have a problem where Midwater saying, hey, this file doesn't have water column, or it's missing navigation, or it complains in any way, this is the first place to start. So you have a look at your data and see what's in it. Okay, so that's step one, import. Step two is do the conversion. So this is the GWC conversion wizard. So this is where you have your one-to-many files um, that you're working with. Um, the second uh, page uh, is an important page. This is where the water column tool is, is correlating the source of the water column data with the source of the navigation. In this case, it's very simple because the nav and the water column packets are in the same file. Um, if you're working with Kongsberg files where they split up the dot all and the WCD, your WCD will appear here where your water column data is, and the navigation will be in the dot all, so it'll try to correlate. If you're dealing with Resan systems and you have, say, an external POSPAC file, um, if you've loaded that as a navigation uh, object, the POSPAC file, that'll be here as a selection. Um, you can also, if you've been, say, recording, uh, uh, you have, you know, 30 reson files and you've recorded one POSPAC file for the entire day, um, you can either load it and have it select each or you can just say, hey, I just want to use one external POSPAC file and point to that. Um, we also have the option to do no navigation. Um, we had some folks um, that thought they shot really good data, um, which they did, but for some reason their navigation system was messed up and previous versions of Midwater uh, would not allow you to proceed if you didn't have good navigation, but now we added an option where you can say, well, I just want to see what my water column data looks like uh, without navigation. You can do that here. Um, nav smoothing, this is really only for systems with really bad nav, uh, which is typically some old SegY files. We have the ability to do some boxcar filtering on the navigation. Typically, you'll, you're not going to use this in modern GPS systems. The final page is another important page is where you do your downsampling. Uh, so the default is two, you can say none, I could do no downsampling. Um, uh, this is dual swath compensation. Uh, this is another key uh, option for the newer uh, Kongsberg systems, the 2040, the 710, the 302, uh, the ones that you can put into dual swath mode. Um, this, the, that mode is problematic for both water column and backscatter processing due to the frequency change. Um, so to get around that, um, until there's a better option figured out uh, coming from them. What you can do is just say, hey, I want to just use the first part of the swath or the second. Um, concatenation, uh, this is where I was talking about uh, being able to virtually concatenate files. Um, if you select to concatenate, you just check that box on, you identify a file name, and then it will concatenate your files together. All right, so I say finish. And we convert to our GWC. Okay. First view you see is the fan view. Um, this is the along track view of the swath, of the water column swath. Um, as I move my time slider, same time slider that you see in Flater Mouse, you know, I move through the water column. Um, if you notice too on the map, if you can see that, there's a little square tipper there that's updating to show the nav position of the vessel as I move through. So I have the, the fan view. I can also see, um, take a look at an individual beam. Uh, let me go to beam 95, so I know it's interesting. So this is, um, I'm looking through the water column at a single beam. A long track is left to right, so as I move my time slider, see that vertical bar move, so it keeps everything correlated. So if you what that does is if you move to this and you say, oh, that's an interesting bit right there. Let me go back to my fan view and see what this looked like across track. There's my cross track view. So I'll, you get that time correlation easily, kind of focus in on something that's interesting. And the final uh, one that's used predominantly by the folks that have been out there using Midwater um, is the stacked view. So this is similar to the beam view, except that it's taking all the beams, collapsing them down, so you get this is zero to max range for every beam, and we're taking the maximum signal level uh, to display in that, in that view. And then what I can do is I can say, well, let me...
Aaron? Yeah, we lost. Me? Yeah, we lost audio again. So, um, start with stacking. Sorry, <laughs> I, I wasn't paying That's attention right. to the exact moment that you went out. But That's right. Do, should I pull my headset? Do you think it's the headset that's the problem? Um, I don't. I guess you can go ahead and try it, and I'll let you know if it sounds awful. Yeah, hold on one sec. Let me switch to let me switch to the mic, and let's see if we can get better audio. Sorry, everybody. Technical difficulties. Can you hear me? Um, say a little bit more. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Um, I'll let you know if the echo gets bad. Okay, let me turn it down there. It sounds pretty good. Okay. All right. Let me back back out. Back to here. Okay. So what this is, um, this is the stacked view. So what we have is, uh, again, a long track is, is left to right. You know, if I move my, my time slider, I move through that. But what you're seeing is we've taken all the beams, uh, collapsed them down, so that this is zero to maximum range for all the beams. And uh, we're taking the maximum signal level um, from each of the, the samples in the time series. So what it does is it gives you a very easy way to see where your targets are in the water column. And this happens to be the, the fish traps with their associated um, uh, mooring lines. Now before I do any extraction, let me just go back to the fan view to show you uh, what you were seeing uh, earlier. So this is how you eliminate, you know, if you had some, some outer beams that were a little messy, you could filter out those beams here. Um, if you click the middle of the slider, that will just let you move uh, both ends of it. Um, you can do the same with the range. You know, I could change the near range. I could bring in the far range and move it inside the, um, the uh, first return, the side lobe. And then if that was your, your set, then you could do a stack from that. And then you've had some, you've had some stuff be eliminated. So let me zoom in on that target. And, and there we go. So now I've gotten to, to the pieces that I want to do my export on. So I've thresholded out using beam thresholding, using range thresholding, and using the histogram thresholding. So now I can export. So I want to export an SD, and let's just do the points first. So this is your uh, export options dialog. The majority of the time you won't have to touch this. Uh, most of the uh, options are filled in by the system. Uh, the midwater tool knows what your ping range was. Um, it knows that you didn't select all beams, that you actually have a certain set of beams that you're focusing on. Um, it knows if the system's pitch or roll stabilized. Um, it allows you to, to add uh, a beam number uh, or to not export time as an attribute. Um, vertical blanking, this is if you're dealing with single beam data. Um, you can blank above or at or below uh, a nadir bottom detect. And then transformation. So the GWC is uh, geographic WGS84, and you can transform on the way out. Uh, it just so happens I have this uh, set up to, to automatically pick the local UTM zone. So let me just put that out. And then if I go to the mouse. And there's my two points. Let me take out a little of the distortion. Let me color those by height. So there's my water column points. They are time aware. So if I move the time slider in, uh, in Fleeter Mouse, you'll see those change. Actually, I think. Uh, actually, let's do this. Let's bring in that line. So we can get, oops, get some more information. I'll bring in the bathymetry. Okay, 
there's my local bathymetry. So then you can see, you know, this is something that you'd work on uh, in the PFM when you're cubing, is that this is artificial due to the due to the water column target there. So this would be worked out and edited um, when you're when you're uh, processing the PFM. So let's go back to the water column tool, export some more metaphors. Um, let's go back to fan view. Let me open everything up and let's just export the full fan. Same thing. I don't need to change any of those bits. It's telling me there's five pings that are missing that. Let's say, yeah, that's fine. I'll just ignore those. Pick out a flicker mouse. Always shows up in your recent objects. And there's my fan. Now, the interesting thing about this SD object is it uh, behaves very similar to the way it behaves uh, in the water column tool. So you can play around with um, the beam range. You can play around with the range range. In. You can change the color map, you can change the histogram. You know, so you have pretty much full control over, uh, over this metaphor. If I just you know, change my time, then I can set it to just play. Then you get a view of what's going on. Okay, let's bring in a curtain. So let me go back to my beam 95 that I know is interesting. Actually, let me change the color map for fun. And let's just export this guy. So we're going to get a long track beam aligned curtain. Mouse. Again, it's going to show up at the top of your list. You see one, and there it is. Now you can set some transparency on this. Um, I could turn off, say, the points. You'd see that intersection. So again, this gives you, remember, it gives you low, um, low distortion of long track, uh, so you can get a better view of what that object looks like. And it is also time aware. So everything's synchronized. And the final one on um, this current version is a um, high stuff surface. Uh, let me put my color map back. This is not that interesting as an ISO surface, but you don't get the idea. Export that. Now this is the only key bit. Um, it means you need to kind of know the um, the um, along track or, or down beam range uh, resolution uh, of your sonar. Um, typically what I do is I kind of futz with this so I get something that looks reasonable. Um, I know in shallow water for the EM systems and meters a, a good one to choose. So I'll select that. One and then bring that into the scene. Now this is not time aware. It's a static object. But if I turn these other guys off, you can see that it's a ISO surface. I can you know, color it differently. I can color it by height. I can set up the transparency. I can also change what the ISO value is. That it's, that it's built on and recompute the ISO surface. I'll show you wireframe. You know, that's basically what it looks like. This is really good for, for um, you know, good volumetric objects like schools of fish uh, and plumes. This works really well. Okay. Let's go back to the water column tool. I think. I think, Aaron, for this first part, that's the general workflow uh, for getting data all the way through the, the water column tool. So probably now is a good time to pause for some questions before I move on to the next bit. 
All right. I am. Um, I do have a couple questions for you. Uh, the first one's back to when you were bringing in data um, with the navigation. Um, you mentioned that you could use pause pack, but if you had, say, an AUV or an ROV um, and you had to do reprocessing in the navigation, how would you go about reinserting that? With um, the, the version 732 uh, C patch that's coming out, um, there's actually a plugin. I'm going to talk about plugins. Um, that's an ASCII importer. Um, this is built specifically for, for folks that are doing that, for folks that are reprocessing AUV data. Um, the, the folks that we're dealing with uh, that have done this before, like uh, um, people at Hui, um, they have their own special format that they use. And what the ASCII uh, import um, plugin does, um, it lets you basically select what column is what type, you know, the X, Y, Z position, heading, depth, etc. And then what it does is it turns that file into an S7K. So Midwater natively supports navigation in any of its native formats. So 7K, .all, WCD, GSF, it can understand that. Um, pause back, but also uh, when you're dealing with ASCII data, what the importer does is it just turns it into something that the Midwater tool knows. So it turns it into an S7K file that can then be used um, as your input now. And there's a, uh, once you've done that, let me go back to the water column tool, there's a function called renav, which is right here, integrate new navigation. Um, and what you do is you just point it at that file and it'll do the time-based lookup and change all the navigation in the GWC. So it doesn't in place uh, a replacement of the nav in the GWC. All right, great. Um, a couple more questions. Um, I think this is something that's coming as well, but we might as well address it, or at least um, you can tell, tell us if you're going to talk about it later. Is there a bounding or stacking capability with time? That is, start end times for view of the water column. For a long track, there is coming. I'll show you that. OK. Um, all right, so we'll get to that in the coming part. Um, how does it handle multiple lines over a target? Um, multiple lines over a target. Right now, all of the um, lines are treated independently. But when you export those into the fleet or mouse scene, um, if you're doing, that's one thing I didn't show you. That's other, actually rather important. Let me go back to it. Um, if you're dealing with a hard target like a like a vessel, let's say this was a hard target, and you had it thresholded out, and you had multiple lines that were going over this, um, you can export standard ASCII data, or you can export refracted points. So for currently for Kongsberg systems, um, and then the 733 version will be supported for the rest of the systems, uh, with the addition of a, um, something we call the Sound Velocity Profile Manager. But right now, since SPPs are integrated uh, into the .all files, we can do it directly. So you export refracted points, and the, all of those points can then be integrated into a PFM to then do your least depth uh, computation. So that's how we deal with it for multiple lines, which I think you may be alluding to specifically around um, RECs. Otherwise, if it's a plume um, or um, you know some other biologic, um, what you can do is you can export data without time associated. So if you notice when you uh, like exported just the raw points, you just disable that and you can have a big static cloud um, in your scene. Okay. Um, JP, if that doesn't answer your question, I'll let us know and we'll try and clarify it more. Um, one more question. With the ISO surface, what does that value mean? Is that um, decibels or what what is the value exactly well the so the ISO value is the value that you exported so in the case of this um, data file I exported the amplitude um, if you have a calibrated sonar sonar you can export the volume scattering strength or the target strength and then the ISO surface I mean ISO surfaces are basically technology that came out of the medical industry um, and it builds an ISO surface around those uh, at that the transition of that um, uh, specific signal level. But what it is is dependent upon actually what you're exporting. 
So in this case, in the water column tool, it can be amplitude, power, SV, or target strength. Um, and in the upcoming versions, um, it can also be a custom uh, signal um, that's computed uh, through a plugin. So if you have your own custom signal processing, um, that's what it'll export. Okay, so with amplitude it would be dB, but with other things it would be different. Um, no, what? amplitude it's not. It's okay, it's sorry. Not <laughs> These two, if that's specifically units you're talking about, yeah. then yes, these two are dB, this is dB, this is dimensionless. It's raw dimensions. amplitude that's in the, the data file. Okay, and um, I lied, there's one more question. Um, okay. When you're using Quincy, do you need to export in a particular format to use it in the Midwater tool? You have to acquire, um, that's something I'm, I don't know yet, because um, I'm not in Canada this week attending the the Quincy training seminar, um, but I, it, it's it's basically in the setup, the configuration of your system as to what you're recording. Um, so you do have to configure to record the water column packets, and then um, there's an importer, an import plugin where we read the Quincy DB files directly uh, to extract right now um, the uh, uh, Semrad data or the Archisonics data, which is what they're currently supporting for water. Okay, and that import plugin, that's uh, packaged with the software plugin, right? That's just available for Correct. everybody. Yep. All right, I think that's it, so you can go ahead and continue on. Thanks. Okay, sure. All right. All right, so now I want to talk a little bit about uh, plugins. Uh, these are uh, currently in the 732 release, the one that's out there. Um, there's going to be a few more coming in the next patch, and then they're going to be out in a big way um, in 733. So what is a plugin? So a plugin is basically, uh, this is a good wiki definition, and it's actually fairly accurate. It's a software component that extends the capabilities of a larger software product. Um, um, and it extends that capability without having to modify the source product. So we can extend the capabilities of tools like the Midwater tool, uh, the FM Geocoder toolbox uh, without having to release a whole new version. All we have to do is post uh, a new capability as a plugin on the web, and then you download the plugin, put it in the plugins folder, and that capability is instantly available for your application. Um, that's what makes them powerful. You shut down the app, uh, you put a plugin in a folder, and you restart the app, and you have the new functionality. And I can show you this. How are they implemented? Uh, they're C++. Um, we're going to have a public um, SDK that will be available from our site. There will be a, a special uh, plugins part of our site. It will be a free uh, development environment that anybody that's uh, got some coding chops can download. Um, it will be cross-platform, Mac, PC, Linux. So, uh, and it's very simple. It's a set of header files. Um, there's no additional static libraries that you have to worry about linking. And what you're doing is you're basically building a DLL. And that DLL is then uh, put into the plugins folder, and it adheres to a specific interface, and then the tools that are hosts, plugin hosts, know how to hook that plugin up. Um, and typically what you have in a, a typical plugin environment is you'll have a host that's an application, you have a virtual interface where the app can talk to the plugin, uh, do things like, hey, what's your name, what's your, who, who's, who's your manufacturer, and I want you to run that, I want you to execute. Um, but what we do is it's actually a bi-directional interface. Uh, so not only can the application talk to the plugin, but the plugin can talk back to the application and request sp specific resources or request information um, that's specific to the application. So for example, in the Midwater tool, um, it can ask the Midwater tool what the current ping is. Um, it can ask it for the current GWC packet. Um, it can ask it the current area of interest. So there's a lot of information that can flow back and forth. Um, it also completely exposes our, our I.O. system, uh, so the plugins have full access um, to our uh, high-speed I.O. system that supports all of our uh, all the file formats that we support. And then depending upon the plugin and where it, uh, how it hooks into uh, uh, the Midwater tool or GT, um, it also automatically takes advantage of our full multi-core environment. And let me give you a quick example of that. I'll show you two things. This is so. This is 733. So you'll see some stuff 
it's going to be coming, but what I want to show you quickly is the example of a plugin. So if you notice here that under the tools menu, um, there's just these bits here. Notice plot heave is the last uh, menu item. Um, so what I'm going to do is turn the application off. Um, I have a plugin here called uh, the datagram uh, viewer. I'm going to copy that in the plugins folder. And then I'll restart the application. Hopefully it won't make a wire on me. And then if I go to the tools menu, this is a that plugin is a tool type shared tool menu option, and there it appears. So what happens is the application enumerated the plugins that were available in the plugins folder, uh, found that there was a uh, what we call a shared tool plugin, and hooked it up to the appropriate place uh, in the in the user interface. Um, and in this case, it's a datagram viewer, so you know, I can go to the specific that file and show you. And that's data grab here. So this is all done uh, by the plugin. So we can really extend the capabilities um, of the application. Um, each application has different a different set of plugin types. Um, for the midwater tool, um, you'll have um, uh, dual plugins. You'll have import plugins. And I was telling you about the ASCII importer. It'll appear here in the import plugin. You have export plugins. Uh, as an example, the refraction is currently a plugin that's shipping right now in 732. Um, you'll also have uh, what are called context sensitive plugins, so the right click menus of these can have plugins. And more deep uh, uh, plugins like with uh, the Geocoder toolbox where you can actually swap out different parts of the processing uh, um, pipeline. So for example the backscatter correction algorithm you could change it out. Something that's similar to that in the water column tool is the custom signal processing tool. So if you have your own special volume scattering algorithm, um, you can build a plugin for that and then select it from the custom tool. All right, so let me show you a couple of the new things that will be uh, out hopefully later this summer in 733. So uh, there's an aux display, the first thing. So this is an auxiliary display that's you know still time synchronized. So for example, if I'm looking at the stack view here in the main view, um, I still get to see the, um, the fan view. Uh, and of course, this is a tear off. You know, I can tear this off and put it on my second monitor and make it nice and giant. Um, the other thing, too, is this a long track fan view um, is stackable. So this is my stack count. So I can stack you know, any number of pings along track. If you notice, you get some annotation, you get these dotted lines that basically show you uh, what we're stacking. So as you move through the water column in your stack view, you're also getting an along track stack in the fan. So variable number of pings, um, and you'll get the indication here on what you're looking at. If I turn that back to, let's go back to zero, we're just going to be getting the single without a stack. Um, you can also reverse that. You know, I could have move it up here a little bit. You could have the stack view uh, here. If I can get this guy to move. Oh wait, I'm sorry, I'm grabbing the right thing. And if I change this to fan view, you know, and I still have my time correlation. So this is good for getting that um, the correlated uh, different views. So along with the auxiliary display, we also have um, some time series. Uh, plotting. Uh, so we have a lot of folks that are doing time series analysis of water column data. So you get your time series plot. When you're in the fan view, uh, you can move through uh, your different beams. You can see your time series here. Um, you can also see that same view, your time series when you're in beam view. So as I move, oops, excuse me, as I move through the, the data, that's the time series for the particular beam. Um, and if I'm in the stack view, in this view, um, it's actually, you know, it's, it's an artificial time series. Um, there's the big bottom spike right there. But this is basically the time series from this artificially generated maximum um, signal. All right, along with that, let me park this guy back in. Along with that, there's a couple uh, other metaphors for export. Um, if I go back to the fan view, if 
you find something interesting, um, instead of the full time series fan view, uh, we can export um, what we call a fan snapshot. So that'll be a single frame um, of the fan. Um, and you can also export something we call a stacked curtain. So the stacked view, um, but as a vertical curtain. So it's not uh, geographically correct, but it can give you, um, you know, good situational awareness of what uh, the entire the entire scene contain. It's a couple more metaphors that were uh, were requested from customers. But again, um, the export SD and the export data, these are all plug-in capable. So um, you'll probably see a lot more uh, different types of metaphors that are that will appear there. And then one other bit. And last thing I hope I have the hopefully I still have the project. Yeah, this guy. So this was a, um, a project that had a dot all file and a WCD. This is a EM2040. Um, this is this is you don't have to wait for 733 for this. This is currently in 732. Um, but data like Reson data and data, uh, the new newer Kongsberg sonars, where we can get a hold of um, the bottom return or, or, or what the predicted bottom sample was, um, we display that. And what's really handy about this, um, let's see, I can turn it on and off. So this was the bottom solution. What's really handy about this is it's a clear indication of what you're actually missing by the bottom return. So anybody who's doing bathymetric surveys that think, hey, if I do a bathymetric survey, I have my least depth. Well, this is what your bathymetric solution was, but all of this big structure here that's appearing in the water column, that's real stuff. That's a down rig. So um, this little uh, indicator is really handy for showing you uh, or assisting you in seeing uh, the rest of the picture that you're missing. And again, this is currently part of uh, shipping 732 and it's used for the sonars that uh, uh, support having the uh, solution in the datagram. And I think those are the key bits, Aaron. All right. Um, thanks, Mo. Uh, I think I did have one. I had a question I wanted you to clear up a little bit, but while I'm asking this question, if anybody has any questions, now is the time to get them in. We're at the end, so um, start typing furiously, or if you prefer, you can raise your hand, and um, I can unmute you, and you could talk to us. But in the meantime, Mo, can you just, um, can you just, you talked about the, the plug-in that's in the current release um, for the refracted points. There were some issues this morning on the webinar with the, the nomenclature. So can you just be clear on what you mean by that and um, how it differs from the other point export and then possibly what um, somebody might do with it? So the difference, and I'm a little unclear with that, the difference between the different types of plugins? No, no, the, you had the plugin for the refracted points. How that differs yes. from our normal point export, just what exactly oh. you mean by refracted points oh, and okay. what somebody would use it for. Right. Um, the uh, standard point export is basically just taking the transform of the transducer head, so where the head's looking um, in its simplest form, and takes the sample that's in the beam and it knows the range of that sample due to the sample interval, uh, it's time-based, and using the standard um, uh, sound velocity that, the, that is at the head of the transducer, so it computes a range, and then it transforms it by any vessel motion, and that is your exported point. The refracted point, points, um, that uses the sound velocity profile uh, to take the different sound speed changes all the way through the water column and properly refract the beam as it moves away from the transducer head. So folks unfamiliar with refraction, just think of pointing a flashlight into a glass of water and you see the light bend. So what happens in, in, uh, you know, in a, in a, in a non-homogeneous uh, water column where you have a lot of different temperature and salinity levels, sound will bend at those different interface points. So what happens is it doesn't travel in a straight line. So if you do proper refraction, um, what you'll see is that where you thought the end point was at a particular range, 
is not actually where it ended up. So what the refraction pipeline does is it does that full refraction down the beam. So if you're doing something that's really sensitive, like a hydrographic survey, then your points are fully refracted and they'll they'll close, you know, they'll match what your or better fit to what your uh, bathymetric survey was. If you're just dealing with fish, uh, you know, schools of fish, um, those are soft targets that are inherently fuzzy, so you do, don't necessarily have to do a refractive solution. But if you're doing a hydrographic survey or you know a hard target on the seabed, um, you probably want to export refracted points. So hopefully that explains it. Does that help here? Oh yeah, yep. that was that was a good example. Thanks. Um, I think that is it. Um, I don't see any other questions coming in. Um, so I I guess we can wrap up. Um, just so everybody knows, this webinar was recorded and also the one this morning, so I'll post both of them on the website. I'm also going to make a, a final list of all the questions that were asked um, in both sessions, and they'll be posted as well as a, as a word, word doc or a PDF. So they should be up sometime tomorrow. Um, I think that's everything. So um, thanks, Mo, and thank you all for attending. And um, hopefully we'll see you all again on our next webinar. Good evening, good Thanks. afternoon, bye.